Uh, my name is Colin Canelli. I am the chair of Together We're Bitter uh, Cooperative Brewing, incorporated in Kitchener, Ontario. It's a uh, multi-stakeholder co-op that is, um, is starting in Kitchener, Ontario. Uh, we don't have a location yet. That's one of the most imminent uh, uh, tasks that we're working on right now. We've incorporated in four days from now a year ago. So we incorporated on the 26th or 27th of October um, a year ago. And we were supposed to be serving beer two months ago or three months ago, um, depending on who I was talking to at the time and, and what we were um, expecting. So it's been a long, hard slog, but uh, this is the sum total of our uh, our knowledge uh, so far of the startup process. So, um, and, and, and yeah, we are a, uh, a, a, a we're hopefully going to be a worker or a, a multi-stakeholder um, cooperative brew pub. So the uh, right into our vision, for, um, so I'll go from uh, the bottom left to up around. So we're going to serve, the, the idea is to be a traditional sort of an American style uh, brew pub, craft brew pub, where we'll serve uh, six or seven uh, beers year round and uh, a lot of seasonals and cask ales and pair that with a, uh, a selection, a limited menu selection of locally sourced food and other and and, uh, um, and put it into a uh, some sort of uh, wood fired oven or some other unique uh, homey folksy comfortable way of uh, of serving food so all this grandiose uh, every the, the place that we all want to be and, and go to um, in, in about a couple hours so um, <laughs> So and then and also keep it keep it very local like the uh, uh, like the sign says beer from here food from near so keep it in, keep it very local so that is uh, that is what we want to be um, our origin story is my my background is in uh, rural tourism development or tourism development and this idea the concept for it it came from my research into um, into how tourism develops in rural areas and it often develops in a in a very unequal manner as as much as I mean it, with with all the same um, hazards that uh, Peter had documented earlier exacerbated because of the remoteness of these communities and um, this is whereby um, as it says in the in the second uh, bullet point. The uh, craft beer often draws tourists in, and you can see that in many places throughout the states and Canada. I, uh, the most uh, uh, closest example that we have in, in Kitchener is St. Jacob's where uh, a, a new brew pub is, or a new uh, craft brewery has just opened up block three and they were supported heavily by the developer of St. Jacob's who is pretty much hegemonic in that town and, and owns the town and said we need to attract more younger tourists here that spend more money and craft beer does that. And so in rural areas is um, that that money goes to uh, the craft beer uh, or craft brewer or the the hotel or the restaurant that serves tourists that bring in outside money oftentimes and, and speaking of the uneven development oftentimes that money goes in to buy up other places because properties are so cheap and there becomes a, a, a sort of a, a control political and economic control by a, um, a a small elite in an area whereby the owners of the tourist based businesses such as craft brew pubs or hotels or what have you um, control a lot of the economy of the town and a lot of the politics of the town so the idea came from my research that let's try to find a more equitable way it maybe tourism can work I had a very um, negative view of, of tourism and development, but I said maybe it can work if the the jobs that are created are uh, the the money is uh, is distributed more equitably because of the, while there is um, a few people getting very wealthy, the mass amount of tourism jobs are, are very poorly paid. So the idea was um, to create something that tourists would come to in a rural area and uh, and make it in a business structure that uh, would more equitably distribute that that money, and that's that's where the co-op came in, and and, and not just more equitably distributed, but um, all the seven principles that, that Peter discussed, uh, um, be more d uh, transparent, more democratic, more educational, all those things. And so the idea was to, to sort of create a um, create this and put it into into practice in northern Michigan in a place called Calumet in, um, in, upper, in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And uh, then my partner got a, a nice cushy job at the university, so I, I started looking around at uh, Kitchener and started to talk to um, friends and, and colleagues that became very interested in, in the idea. And Kitchener didn't have a brew pub, still doesn't have a brew pub. And so 
uh -oh, uh, uh, still doesn't have a brew pub. So we decided let's let's do this. Let's do it here, and uh, and there's no better time and no better place than than Kitchener. So that is uh, that is the origin story behind that. And as um, as we grew, um, people gravitated towards it. And we'll talk. I'll talk about the the the. As, as I had answered that question, the people who gravitated and the, the different skills they brought and how that's really helped us. So we are a multi-stakeholder co-op. We, when we started, we, we went and first thing we did was went and talked to, to Peter and said, uh, um, told him our idea and he said, uh, um, we told him we were going to be the only um, co-op brew pub in North America outside of Black Star Co-op in Austin. And he immediately said, have you gone and checked out the um, co-ops in uh, Quebec? And sure enough, there were seven worker-owned co-op uh, brew pubs in Quebec that we had <laughs> overlooked. And uh, still, to this day, when you hear about co-op brew pubs, um, nobody mentions the seven that are in Quebec. For good reason, because Quebec is a country unto itself when it comes to co-ops, which I'll talk about in a bit because of the level of support and the um, and the amount of um, uh, of aid that's given to them, or amount of, uh, of yeah the, the the support for them. So we we started as a worker owner co op, but uh, it slowly became saw the limits of that in in a very capital intensive startup, uh, which is which is what a uh, a brew pub is. I mean we're looking at half a million dollars, upwards of half a million dollars to start this just with uh, brewing equipment and renovation of space and and so on. So we we realized that our limits, our buy-ins, and, and and even the the extra buy-ins that we've done um, aren't going to go far enough to get us um, to a point where we can um, get even a, a, a percentage, the needed percentage on a Canadian small business loan. So we de we devised a way of um, of going out to the community and sort of a, uh, gaining their support and 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 getting investment um, from the community. And the more we did that, and we had people come in to our uh, to our house actually, and, and and one of our other worker owners' house, and gave them a pitch and said, "Hey, we're coming. If you're interested in investing a, um, a modest sum, about five to ten thousand dollars, then um, then this is our presentation to you, and and we're going to be a good part of this community. And the more we got feedback and questions answered, and uh, there are questions asked, we realized that we were being a bit disingenuous just asking them to um, to to, to uh, loan or not even loan us money, but to to invest in us and have and have them pay uh, or us pay out a dividend of of eight percent. So we determined to make it. Uh, a community supporter or a multi-stakeholder co-op and incorporate that that community of um, uh, the, the the community supporter um, membership which is a bunch of people who are interested in having a co-op brew pub in their town would benefit from this would like to go down and have something that's more community based and where they can go and drink as opposed to going and drinking at a, a sort of a corporate uh, um, uh, like a, a pub or, or something like that or a, a Kelsey's or a, a, a Krabby Joe's um, they can come down to a a, a brew pub that, that's in their town that they help fund. So we we endeavored to make it a uh, um, to, to give them a sh uh, give them not only shares or, or sell them shares, but also have a say on the board. So right now our multi-stakeholder co-op is made up of two thirds worker owners. <coughs> so the workers still have control and 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 a, and a significant majority say in the in their workplace, much like as as Peter um, had pointed out with the worker co-ops. Um, but the community supporters are also have one have one third. So they uh, w we're we're going to. It, they, they're a sort of a check on our um, on, on us getting um, too mired down in the situation of the workers. So. Um and uh, as uh, it, it, one of the things we, um, we've learned in, 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 in researching this and working with our co-op developer is that uh, th these multi-stakeholder co-ops can, can be very troublesome sometimes if there's conflict between the stakeholders. So we did have to do a lot of soul searching and a lot of discussion and debate about whether having community supporters and, and worker owners is a symbiotic relationship or it's going to be an adversarial relationship. And we found that um, we, we could probably, through communication and open dialogue, um, have a very um, a robust uh, multi-stakeholder co-op that probably will run into conflicts like any um, any organization made of people do, uh, or even a room with two people in it. Um, so, but we, these are ones that can be overcome and 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 ones that'll make us a stronger a stronger entity. So, the. Uh, 
So I'm just going to go into the unexpected barriers that, that because I, I thought the one thing that, that we could add as, as a co-op um, or as a, as a starting co-op was some of the um, was some of the issues that are that in the current climate and I know urbane cyclists is they've been almost 18 years up and um, up and running and right now that the, I can't imagine that it's much different because it sounds like you hit a lot of the same issues but uh, some of our unexpe unexpected barriers were the the virtual lack of support for for co-op development for co-op in, in Ontario and that was that's in relation to going to Quebec uh, upon Peter's suggestion we went up and took a road trip and and did the hard slog research of going to brew pub after brew pub um, and uh, um, somebody, had to do it. It, somebody had to do it exactly um, we did keep our uh, sweat equity hours only to the time we were talking business <laughs> in the group um, so, um, we, uh, so th we found that, that there was a significant amount of support for, for co-ops in, in, uh, in Quebec. They, they would get up to $25,000 for, for, de for developers and consultants, which they promptly used to pay people to write their bylaws, and, or not just write their bylaws, but to work them through the bylaws, work them through the Articles of Incorporation um, in, in brewing case, uh, to, to hire um, uh, brewers or, or consultants to come in and teach them how to set up their brewery and so on and so forth, which is a and, and the legal help and, and pay for the legal help, which is a tremendous help, which is all money that's coming out of our pocket right now, and there's virtually nothing for here in uh, um, in, in Ontario. So that was one of the things that's a, a very vexing and, and troublesome uh, issue. It wouldn't have been that troublesome if we had never seen Quebec, but having seen Quebec, um, it, it becomes very consternating. The other one is the tax tax code and provincial legislation. Uh, we didn't, we, when we first uh, started going out to the community to try to um, be, make them a part of the community supporter network, uh, we thought that this could be um, RRSP eligible. Investments in this could be RRSP eligible. And and they can, but they can't. And and there's a morass of tax code laws that really inhibits that and, and makes it very cost prohibitive to have any any semblance of a guarantee um, that these uh, that, that investments from the outside, from outside investors, not necessarily from individuals within, but from outside, can be um, uh, can, can be taxed or, or RSP eligible. So that was something that we sort of chased our tail on for for quite some time. Provincial legislation around. Uh, how many how many people we can go out to the the exemption there's an exemption in the co-op act that allows us to go out to 35 people 30 we, 35 people that um, to, to gain investment so from the worker owner standpoint and uh, the, the we we're part of that 35 but also uh, potential community supporters are part of that 35 so it becomes very if, if we're asking for five thousand uh, dollar investments it, that that 35 fills up very quickly so um, those and and also also, there's a, a $200,000 uh, cap on that. So it's a um, it, it's we can go out to um, I, I guess it's um, as many people as it's a very convoluted uh, um, system. We can go out to as many people as we want for a thousand dollars a year, but uh, we can't go out. We can't get more than two hundred thousand dollars from the thirty-five. People Unless something. you go to an offering statement, and and that is the the vexing part is so we have put together an offering statement. We have an offering statement. However, that is another process that we're and we're working with a, a very good uh, um, co-op developer by the name of George Ockley, who was a, a member of the Financial Service Commission of Ontario, who is um, is advising us that it's a good idea to do it. So we have it in our back pocket, but it's also a, a fairly labor and or time intensive uh, uh, process, and um, sort of locks us into. Uh, uh, certain regulations or certain um, uh, certain practices that right now at the startup um, would make it a little less flexible for us to do. So we've opted to um, hold off on submitting that um, a, that offering statement till after we've at least got uh, got a place and started uh, to to invest in the place, and then sort of offer that when we can when we have the time to raise capital for possible other um, improvements or, or other things. So it was just a um, the provincial legislation isn't as conducive to um, to raise <laughs> funds from outside sources as um, as we'd like it to be um, and so financing is the is the final thing and I have a question mark there because as Reba pointed out there's uh, the banks are um, we're, we're with Libro um, because they're one of the only banks or one of the only sorry credit unions in uh, a Kitchener Waterloo that does a that offers the Canadian small business financing loan and we went with them um, and and we've had a very good um, that we've had a very good relation we built a, a great relation with our financial manager who um, and and this is to the to the point that, that I, I believe 
think Peter was making uh, was that when we walked into the to Libro and we showed them our, our business plan, one of the probably probably the fifth or sixth draft of our business plan, um, he said, "Wow, you're you're very similar to us. Like your business model is very similar to us." And I was a little shocked that as a co-op, they didn't when when we said we were a co-op, they didn't just automatically assume that we were going to be much like them. It was it was sort of wow, there's other businesses that are like us, and and so even the even the credit unions are unfamiliar with with the co-op model. So it makes it a little uh, a little bit more difficult. The, we have gotten a lot of good feedback now. Um, uh, uh, AJ, our our, our manager, our our, um, our consultant or whatever his business manager guy um, has left, and so we're now dealing with the branch manager who has been very um, very helpful as well and and supportive. Um, we're, we'll see when we put in our business plan next week um, with our financials and everything how much they will give us but uh, or, or what percentage we're looking at um, gaining a percentage of um, the maximum which is 350 where um, they say that they can give us up to eight or eighty percent which is um, incredible and not many businesses get that but they're telling us that and the, the branch managers have a lot more control at the cost populars or the um, or the credit union so we're hoping to um, that, that they'll be closer to that eighty percent than the 50%, so we won't have to raise as much of our own capital. Um, but we still do have to um, put in uh, our personal guarantees from, from our members. And so that is, the, that's, a, I guess, the final um, uh, unexpected barrier of financing. And, and one thing that, that I think was, was unclear to me when we started um, was that there is, uh, I, I compare us to um, our, our friends at uh, uh, Royal City in Guelph, which is a, a small craft brewery in Guelph that, that just opened up, and Cam and Russ are two guys, two friends that wanted to open a craft brewery, and they both mortgaged their house or took a took a mortgages out on their house and uh, and and built this craft brewery in with all the financial projections that they had that said that they're going to be able to make the money and pay it back, and it's not the margins are, are fairly large and and good and um, and. And so they they took the risk and and risked their their family's house and and their livelihoods on uh, on this brew pub in the hopes that it will return a major investment, which is fine as a small business, um, but uh, as a co-op, somebody is an entity that wants to set a foundation of equality um, to ask the members. And I don't own a house. Alex doesn't own a house. I'm not, I don't mean to give your financial situation away, but uh, um, Alex doesn't own a house that she's told us about. Um, but uh, <laughs> um, but uh, but our but but a couple of our members do, and they're uh, and and we wouldn't we don't want to uh, to ask them, and and they shouldn't have to be asked, and and I don't know if they would would do it, uh, put their house up as a, as a guarantee, but we're going to have to um, put up guarantees, and um, and so that makes it difficult for us to go out and get financing when um, when the guarantee or any 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 large amount of financing when the guarantees that have to be put up are often people's houses. Um, and so fortunately, the Canadian Small Business Loan is backed by the government. So there's a, a, a reduced liability there. There's reduced risk there in, in terms of uh, the, the assets that are gone after. But um, still, there's a uh, there's a considerable amount on the line for those people who have families and houses and stuff. And we can't necessarily do that. We can't have people mortgage their house to help start this. So that's one of our, our unexpected barriers that, that really is is a challenge. But it's, it's we're working Working around it, um, two minutes. Wow, I'm going slower than I thought. Um, so the benefits. Um, so there's a uh, the 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 benefit is that as a smug. First of all, smug self righteousness, which don't don't discount that because it because it, it's pretty much the only thing that keeps you going. Ever like when when the, when the chips are down and things are bad and you ask yourself why when 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 everybody starts talking why don't we just start this and 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 then become a co-op and. Uh, but but then you you realize why you're all together and why this is a better idea. Um, it's because of that smug self righteousness that we're going to change the, the way that business is done and um, and so that that helps. So don't discount that. Um, but I mean don't rely on it and don't take yourself uh, too smug. Don't be too smug about it. Um, so a community engagement has really driven us because we've had a lot of uh, uh, of, of great support and outpouring of from the community, from politicians, from uh, from local media, and from from just the, the community members that hear about it. I mean, it doesn't hurt that we've been giving away a 
shitload of free beer, um, but um, but we still do. But we still we still find that, that a lot of people when they hear we're starting a co-op brew pub are, are very excited, and they're not just excited about the fact that it's a brew pub. Um, they're excited about the fact that it's it's co-op, that it's got more more to it. As one person said to to us uh, that came in, who's now um, really interested in uh, just a good guy, said um, you kind of got us in with the craft beer, but you kept us with the values, and I think that's what we're uh, uh, we're aiming for. And then finally, the diversity of skills is really a benefit. I mean, as I pointed out earlier, um, Alex is our communications director. She has been Twittering and Facebooking and, and getting our message out there in every possible way to the point where we now have 600 Twitter followers and 300 Facebook followers, and we have not even have a, a location yet. So um, she's been doing a great job at that. We have... Um, my partner, Lindsay, who's been our administrator, who's keeping us going, taking the minutes, making sure everything's flowing. She's also our president. Um, and Ben and, and Greg, who are um, doing our, uh, who are, who are tradespeople, who are out there selling us and, and also uh, planning our, 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 um, our building and making sure that we have a sound building and we're not going to run into any unexpected costs um, in the building. So, um, so that really has, is helpful because there's a lot of things that we, that we couldn't do even as a partnership with a couple people that, that we can do with this co-op and so oh, I'm going the wrong way sorry um, ch -ch 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 -ch. Um, I just quick uh, point out the support of Ontario Co-op and Peter and his gang over there have been great. Um, one of the greatest things that they've done, I mean, other than all the great advice and information they've given us, was lend us the game Co-opoly, which I think, if you want to know the challenges of, of running a, a co-op, I think that is really a, a great game to play. It's like Monopoly, but you it's the game where everybody wins, where everybody loses, and you have to make sure that everybody is, is taken care of without, as Reba said, you have to make sure that um, if you're paying people, um, you're not going to bankrupt the the company, and you have to. And so it's a really good uh, uh, game. Um, and and thank you for for lending it to us. Um, the Canadian Worker Co-op Federation has helped us a lot and given us some. Uh, um, some support. Other worker co-ops have been uh, just incredible with um, <coughs> with their uh, uh, with their support. La Siembra has reached out to us um, um, just uh, sort of unprompted and given us a lot of feedback, a lot of information. Uh, uh, Planet Bean has and Urbane Cyclists, along with Big Carrot and many of the co-op brew pubs in Quebec. So, um, and then finally, our co-op developer George Alcalay has been invaluable, and it's one of the reasons why when I hear uh, what Reba's going through or went through in, in 2012, I, I we we're starting to address that now, hoping to put that foundation and, and mitigate and educate ourselves prior to starting up so we have a, a solid foundation and so we're knowledgeable. So, um, And he's been, been very instrumental in that. Um, and so I, I guess the last slide before I go to our, 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 our slide is, that, uh, um, is the message I want to leave you with is, is don't start a co-op. Um, uh, and, and George Alcalay said uh, um, that uh, we'll get this up and running, and then you guys can go out there and, and go on the, the co-op talking circuit telling people other people not to start a co-op. And I laughed, and I'm like, he's full of shit. But um, he's right. I mean, don't start a co-op unless you believe that unless you believe that it will make a change, and and you have to believe that it's going to make a change. That this is something a different way of doing business and a better way of doing business that isn't um, that that isn't structurally flawed. That is that is a better a, a, a better way of, of building community and sustainability and all that. So, and then I'm gonna leave you with this up there. We just got our um, we just got our, our website up and running at brewing.coop. We're at Twitter TWB Pub and together or TWB Cooperative Brewing and I'm just going to leave this up there while we uh, talk because that's our brand new website. Um, so um, which is just made by another uh, provisional member um, that came on board in the last month, uh, uh, Rob Shorney. So um, he did this uh, uh, he did this for us and I'm going to um, X out of my optimal resolution. So Thank you very much. Thank you. Excellent. My favorite part of today's program, the total free-for-all on questions. Who wants to go first? Nice. I know we had some that I cut off last time, so. I actually had a question for Reba. Um, you mentioned in your presentation about consensus decision-making model, right? Yes. So how does that work in practice? Like, do you guys have managers? Do you figure out a way to kind of divide up between what things you consider big picture and what you kind of consider day to day. Like you're not doing a consensus for like ordering staples and stuff like that, right? Yeah, we keep um, working on that part. We did get all our committee's terms of reference uh, passed this year. Um, so the committees know what they're supposed to be responsible for. 
Um, we'll actually try to have budgets for next year, which will be good. Um, so people are supposed to always act within their job description and within their committee structure. So we, so we're trying to understand what aspects. I mean, we do sometimes get to those member board meetings and start getting into the nitty gritty, and, and you know, it just takes ends up. You you could be hours and hours at a meeting. So, but that that's not exactly where the, the consensus decision comes in. Those are kind of two different questions I think you're asking. Um, you know, our consensus decision-making model, so how we actually make a decision versus who's making, who's responsible for what decision. Yeah, I, what, what I'm interested in is what do you guys consider that falls into the consensus decision-making part versus the stuff that's non-consensus kind of nitty-gritty detail stuff? Well, each committee operates on a consensus decision-making model as well. So... They decide by consensus, um, and they have they have a certain area where they can decide on certain things. They don't have to go to the whole membership, but the whole membership would decide on what their budget is, or if that area was correct, or if it felt like it was um, a difficult thing, or maybe possibly contentious. Would take from the committee, it would go back to the whole membership to to be discussed. So. We're pretty aware since we're you know either on multiple committees or we're all members and we're certainly all working there. Do you have managers that that manage um, the the different parts like the front and the back house or? Um... Yes, we we do. So we have different. We all have job titles, so we have our job positions, so we know where we are in the in the in in the management. We try not to use that word, though we'd still use it since it's such a you know people understand that word out there in the big world, but we don't really like that word. We, we've for, called them coordinators, um, but uh, yeah. something we haven't done it yet. But yeah. Uh, that's, yeah. So, so we do. Like we have a service department manager, and we have a service lead. We have a couple sales leads. Um, so we have administration leads. So and they're yeah. answerable to the board. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Or to their and to their committee oh. as well potentially. So there'd be like we have a we have a purchasing committee. So it's our, obviously, after payroll, that's our biggest, ex, um, not exactly <coughs> expense, but our biggest output of money every year is purchasing. So we have a main a head purchaser, but we have a couple other people who do purchasing, but we have a purchasing committee, but then the whole membership is involved in some of the, like, overall picture of what, um, what kind of purchasing we're doing. Uh, Rob? We're going to follow up or to go back to the comments you made about the exit package for employees. Um, I wasn't sure, and you mentioned I missed it, I wasn't sure if that was applicable to, to retirement or and, and or to uh, termination for cause or, or without cause. It would be uh, applicable to um, termination without cause, but then it might be reduced because right now in the bylaws it's it's vague. I mean, I had written it, put the bylaw in for discussion, and it, it's not finalized. So it says, you know, things like, well, what different things that we decide. So we would base it on, we would look at somebody, and if we were terminating, you know, with some cause or, you know, it wasn't working out, um, it might not be the same percentage of. So what we based it on was a percentage of your current wage times the, your total number of hours that you've um, put into the co-op as a member. So it might be re it might be a reduced amount. So if someone was leaving with a really outstanding record, then it, it could be um, the maximum amount, or it could be a reduced amount, or it potentially it could be zero. There could be no thank you package. If really we're saying, okay, like really, we have to end this relationship, but, um, so... So if that were to happen, you would have to buy up their shares, right? Oh yeah, but that's not, that's not an issue at all. That doesn't come into it. They own those, we're legally obliged to redeem those shares uh, within a set amount of time unless the co-op is, is absolutely unable to pay them back. You know? And we are trying to keep a reserve fund with that amount, so people don't feel um, that that money is at risk. Okay. Yeah. And do you, are there a lot of accountants that understand what you're doing, or are they just the Prentice Gates Clark, or, or like, 
Uh, well, we hired, we looked around for a new accountant a couple years ago, um, and um, we did interview Prentice Yates, but we didn't, we didn't hire them. We hired somebody else, and he, he has um, put in some time to understand um, the model, and um, uh, we're really happy with that. So we would no problem to recommend our accounting firm. They seem to have done a very good job. <coughs> and there was another one, M MNP, I thought. We interviewed them too, but they mostly do bigger co-ops and housing co-ops. So. Who was your accountant? Um, McCray Thorpe. He's got three names, right. so McCray. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. There was a question behind the pillar here. Yeah, I'm just wondering about how the investments work for your hub. Like, what's the difference between a share and a dividend in terms of if someone donates five thousand dollars, are they going to get all of that back, and then when they get it back, do their dividends stop coming in? Yeah, and so that's the and so our the, the structure is that we that you invest um, you invest five thousand um, dollars. It's non-cumulative dividends. So if we don't make a surplus in a year, the the dividends won't be paid, or they'll be paid um, contingent on what we can pay. So every so we have a five plus prime. We've we've set up five plus prime to sort of discourage speculative um, investment, um, but uh, also reward people for for um, in, investing with us. Uh, and so uh, if so, and the board always has the option of purchasing those uh, those shares back at any time with dividends that have accumulated and what have you. So, um, but the the idea is to, to hold on to those investments and to provide the community the people who have who trusted us and, and want to want to or got us started and helped develop um, to to keep paying sort of a, a return. The idea our our. What we said at the beginning was let's uh, in, let's give the money back to the community to the to the people in the community versus um, versus a bank. Um, so if we can if we can get more money from community supporters, um, it's better for us. I mean, we're paying a rate that's maybe around what we'd be paying in the bank, or, or maybe a little less. Um, but it's giving back to the to the community. I don't know. Uh, for those of you who were here last time, you will have heard the West End Co-op talk about the fact that they did their financing through a community bond model. Um, which is a, a very similar uh, approach to what Colin was talking about. Uh, CSI has also done that. Uh, we finance the building that you're in right now, a big chunk of it with the community bond model. We're actually just doing the same thing with a brand new building as well. So we've actually just opened a new community bond offering a few days ago. So if you are interested in learning a little bit more about some how these investments work and they can work for the different models, uh, we are happy to talk to you about it. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes, back here. So, Steve. so the brew pub. I'm um, curious, you were saying that you, you were hoping to be launched a couple of months ago? Yes. And yes. I'm just curious as to what's kind of led up to the delay. If you have and, the, and I left that out. It's it's not the co-op part of it. That's uh, um, it's the it's the starting a brew pub part of it in Kitchener part of it, um, which is uh, um, a uh, a morass of of legal and and uh, of, of of legal and and bylaw and zoning and um, and just the, the the what was that? Parking. parking. Yeah, that it all comes back to parking, um, and so zoning and parking uh, and the proper and the proper structure. So trying to find that is uh, we're we're all set to go. Um, it's just the uh, it's just trying to find a place. You can't get a location or you can't get a loan until you get a location. You can't get a location until you get a loan. Um, we've we've chased uh, a few a few uh, properties down that have turned um, th that have just not been attainable for to us for for various reasons because we we're it's a we have to have something where you can have um, high point loading for for large vats of, of liquid, and has to be zoned in a place that is um, that is industrial, but also allows a restaurant. And so those are very limited. And in addition to the political uh, and, and economic situation of Kitchener, which is booming with the tech companies and developers are buying up every piece of property and only wanting to. Um, to rent to uh, office space like a Google or an Electronic Arts or Desire to Learn, and really not too concerned with uh, trying to let little brew pubs and co-ops uh, um, into the in, into the equation. So um, we've had to expand our our uh, the the areas that we've looked into or looked for um, because of that, and that's took in a lot of time, um, and and having to to get a property that's suitable is just difficult. So. Um, add to that a little bit? No, no, you can't. <laughs> and the support of the municipality and like working with the councillors and the local government, that's been key for us. They've been really helpful in trying to um, 
not bend the rules, but find ways around them with regards to parking, zoning, and things like that. <coughs> That's that's been helpful. Yeah, it it has, and it's not, uh, and it's not for it's for not yeah, it's not it's and, and it's not for political will. We do have a, a tremendous amount of support. What we're finding is that um, that there's very little that uh, that that municipalities can do. Municipalities such as Kitchener, which have a a, a lot of bylaws that have built up over time as as a large industrial city, a lot of bylaws built up over time um, are very difficult to navigate through without the proper um, time to get rezoning or the money to pay lawyers and pay uh, engineers and all that. So we're trying to find that magical property that has all that and is sort of close to the downtown where we want to be. So that's that's kind of the major delay. Excellent. First? Yep. Yeah. Um, I have a question for Reva. You mentioned that um, in your peak season you have a lot more staff. So I imagine like in these situations where you have both worker members and workers who are not members? That's correct. So how does that work in terms of like how much do um, non-member workers participate and they just come in and do their hours and that's it? Like how do you manage that? Yeah, well that's pretty much what happens. They come in and, and work their hours. I mean we do try to have a very participatory workplace so that we we do have a couple of staff meetings during during the season. We do um, team building evenings with um, bikes and beer, so people like to include beer all the time, but people can come in and work on their own bikes after hours and we supply a bit of uh, beer. Um, we, we encourage people to do other things. Um, our education uh, budget is open to non-members and now we've um, written in exactly um, how much of that we would fund if we approve it and then how they can um, pay it off because one uh, one non-member went and took a four thousand dollar course last year, so we'll fund half of it, and then he has to pay off the the, the virtual loan of the two thousand dollars by working a certain number of hours. So he has to stay employed for a certain amount of time, or we could try to recover the money, but it's not really likely. But we're just trying to make sure we. <coughs> understand and somebody else we just straight up loaned them money we paid half and we loaned them the other half because they didn't even have the money so and then we do a payroll deduction so we encourage um, education um, and participation in other community events within our our members so and we just do other things that try to get everybody to participate and we have some subcommittees that uh, staff that would be non-members would be on, maybe even run the whole committee. So. Thank you. Uh, hey, yeah, this is a question for Reba. Um, you said that you did it backwards, but what I kind of took from it was what it looks like to go from like, co-op in a formal sense to then feeling your way through um, making that real in, in the day to day. So I, I'm just wondering if thinking back to like where you were at in 2010 when you did the development process, um, what would you do, what would your first steps look like knowing that you know now? Uh, well, before um, inviting everybody just openly to become a member, um, we would have developed our our actual, the full-on membership um, bylaw, in the bylaws, how, how you become a member. There was something there, but it isn't exactly work for us. and. Also, this idea of the member criteria statement, which I don't know if we could see it, you know, if you were right there, if you could really see that. Um, but I, you know, I would really encourage that in development stage, like I think that together we're bitter is really doing, is put all those things in place because lots of worker co-ops don't really have all that in place, and then they can run into a lot of difficulties down the road. Um, certainly. Um, human resources issues because you don't have something like a criteria statement or you're not openly discussing like you just say well that person's worked here they've met the criteria we're just gonna or they've they've met the hour the number of hours criteria like we they, somebody has to work for us for 18 months and minimum of 2,000 hours before they become a member so we were just like okay you've met that you you know sort of we just made them a member well now 
we say, oh, let's, do we actually want that person as a member? And then if we don't want them, like if, if there's hesitations about that, we say, how do we address those hesitations? Or should that person even continue as a, a staff person um, here? So, you know, why keep somebody on if, if we don't feel that they're going to fit? And we even look at that, it can just be a personality issue. Like, we just don't feel that they're going to fit. Like, you have to be really um, a group that can get along and work out, work through decision decisions. Um, and have people who voice their opinions. Like, like I said in the consensus decision-making model, you don't want someone just to be quiet and go along with it even though they don't feel that it's the right thing because that will come back and bite you later on because they'll go, well, I didn't really agree with that. Well, why didn't you speak up, right? So we, we try to make sure that we, we um, get there and we say, well, if that person's not really, you know, we don't want to just sometimes, we have enough people we sometimes feel like, oh, you don't want to, we need all these people to work. We need to fill all those staff hours. And we're like, oh, we're sometimes afraid to say it's time to let that person go. Um, and you know, sometimes you create a, a gap in your workplace and the right person comes along and you just go, wow. Like, <laughs> you know, we were like our service manager, like, wow, like he has done such a phenomenal job. Um, and you know, it was, it wasn't our choice that member left who was a service manager, but then that position was open. And, um, you know, it's, it's really they're the, the right person for the, the job. So sometimes that's what you have to, to um, look for as, as well. And, and one thing that, that Reben mentioned earlier and that I, I found interesting was that when, as you said, they, they sort of um, learned as they went um, after they had uh, been in place and um, I like what she was talking about in her in her talk about how we d they, they didn't uh, they didn't know something so they didn't just put it in place and that's something that we've done early on is we had bylaws that we sort of that that I had written or and my partner had written um, and put into place but didn't uh, um, we didn't understand them fully and when we stopped to actually talk about them at the board level we realized that there was some heady stuff in there that we didn't understand and that's when we went and, and brought in uh, George Alcalay as a co-op developer because we realized there's there's some things that we could be missing or could be saying that we don't want to be saying and so I, I, I think that's really important from uh, like uh, from the perspective. Yeah, yeah and, I, and I think again it, it leads to the obvious uh, Reboo is being um, not boasting but all this incredible experience that she gained from starting without, with very little help. She's now on the board of directors of the Canadian Worker Co-op Federation. And what that has done is allowed that sharing of knowledge and experience to be available to newer startups like Cullum's. And that's part of our role, to try to you know, not reinvent the wheel, not make the same mistakes, tell people about sweat equity, tell them about having good uh, membership criteria and evaluation. So you hopefully are going to benefit from all that stuff by going to the Canadian Worker Co-op Federation site, the Co-op Zone site, to our site, because we've collected some of that information and Co-op developers like George Alcalay, Russ Christensen, who's going to be doing the next uh, session uh, on November the 12th, you know, why reinvent the wheel? Do it, learn from it, and that's and that's what uh, I know you've helped do by being on the Canadian mm -hmm. Worker Co-op. Human Resources Management is not easy, <laughs> and when you're all the workers and the managers and on the board of directors, it's really tough. So we are really working hard on that all the time to make sure that people's skills are at the right level, their even their attitudes are at the at the right uh, place. So. I can tell you that it's not easy and you you just have to stay on it because co-ops fall apart because of either somebody just dominating <coughs> the whole thing and people not really enjoying what's going on and eventually the things just disappear and you're like, oh, that business just, just went, it just disappeared. And it's, sometimes it's just not from having strong policies and having ways to work around. You know, you say... Oh boy, like, in, in, you know, member number three is really not pulling their weight, but we have no way to have an open um, discussion about that. Uh, 
Thank you. Uh, I'm really conscious of time today, so we are up against uh, the end of our session for today. The good news is we do have a whole other session, as Peter mentioned, on November 12th. Um, this, uh, the third session is going to be called, going to be called Buy Out the Boss. Um, and we're going to take an opportunity to speak to the future. And as Peter pointed out, uh, tr more traditional co-ops succeed more often than more traditional ventures. And as we run through to the end of the baby boomer generation, we are going <coughs> to see a lot of baby boomers coming up to their retirement age. There may be an opportunity in this for co-ops, for people working in those organizations to step in and buy those uh, organizations. So we're hoping that there may be an opportunity for the future, and we're going to discuss that and explore it in the next uh, and final, sadly, uh, version of our co-op series on the 12th of November. Um, anecdotally, the co-op that I was the president uh, of, that is exactly what happened. They lived in a rundown sort of slumlord uh, apartment building before I got there and made the decision that they were going to stage a coup, to be honest with you, and turn it from uh, an apartment building into a co-op very, very successfully, which not only meant that they had control over the building, it meant they got to renovate it as well, and at the same time provide market rent and also subsidized rent, so to really be a cornerstone of the community that they were in. So it's kind of fun to watch those transitions take place. Um, I, I would like to take a moment to thank Peter and Reba and Cullum for coming. Uh, they were super engaging. Thank you so much. I don't know if these guys have some time to talk to you afterwards, but if they do, I'm sure they would be uh, welcome to do so. And thank you for coming. Thank you. The, the one message that I felt was most important was that don't start a cooperative unless you unless you really believe in it. There's no, in, at least in Ontario, there's no um, monetary incentive um, to to starting a cooperative. There's a lot of hard work and a lot of agony and struggle to, to it. But in the long run, if you believe that it's a better way of changing the, the way we, we run our economy, then it will be incredibly rewarding in the end. But if you, if you think that there is other um, tangible incentives, um, such as monetary or, um, or, or, or control or, or, or power, um, they, they, they just aren't there. And that's not enough. That 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 isn't that shouldn't motivate you to start a co-op because it's it's about uh, it's about equality and, and sharing and, and, and being fair. My name is Alex Shaflarska and I am involved in I'm a worker owner with Together We're Bitter Brewing Cooperative. Came in here looking to hear about some of the challenges. Uh, involved in starting a worker-owned co-op uh, or a multi-stakeholder co-op. Um, I definitely came away with a better sense of, of those challenges and how to work around them. Uh, I think all of the speakers kept on point and really spoke honestly uh, and in the spirit of, of sharing and helping each other out. Um, it was a great way to spend two hours. It was uh, a wealth of information. It confirmed a lot of the stuff that I, I, I learned in the year and a half, two years of developing our project, but also um, gave me some real-world information with, uh, with what Reba was talking about, just really good um, uh, practical information from that. So it was a great, uh, a great session. And the, the questions were incredibly engaging. As somebody who's a, who was a lecturer for, for seven years, I, um, I was pleased with the, the insightful questions of, of the members of CSI. Uh, one of the takeaways for me was really the importance of getting everyone on board engaged and educated um, because as opposed to a traditional business model where the roles and responsibilities are much more siloed, in a co-op, although you may have varying degrees of involvement in, in various parts of the business, you are still an owner and you do need to be aware of all of the different components and all of the different things that your partners and co-owners are doing. Uh, and I, I think that's going to be a big challenge and I think that the sooner we can get a structure set up to deal with that sustainably and in a meaningful way, the more likely we are to succeed. Um, what's going to make our brewery special versus a lot of the other ones that are starting up now, which a lot of the other ones are very community-based and focused on the community, but one of what, what makes our special is is our name. I mean, is is together or bitter? There is right now five people who are part of this uh, who are part of this co-op who are who are members and, and, and directors of this co-op who bring incredibly diverse skills and incredibly diverse interests and also a, a, a an incredible array of ideas of how to um, how to 
create a, a better brew pub, how to, how to make people feel comfortable, how to create something unique. And that is what um, a, a craft brew pub should do, is, is create a very unique, authentic experience. And it really doesn't get more authentic and unique than five people coming together from diverse skill sets and diverse backgrounds to uh, all focus on making something a, a, an, a, an entity that's going to improve the community. So that is our authenticity um, that comes from our, our backgrounds and, and, and our collaboration and, our, and who we are, our individuality, is what makes this, um, this project unique. Callum mentioned this during his presentation. We started as a worker-owned co-op and then found because of the nature of the sector in which we were getting involved, it made more sense to be a multi-stakeholder co-op and bring in community owners as well. Uh, it's definitely a learning process. Um, there's, there's a lot of information out there to absorb and luckily there are other co-ops who've gone through this. Um, the Ontario Co-op Association, there are many resources out there to guide you through it. As Peter Cameron said today, the point is not to reinvent the wheel, the point is to learn from the experiences of our peers and really help one another out. Uh, and through the process of restructuring and, and learning about the legalities of it all, we've definitely relied on other co-ops and associations to, to help us out with that. Uh, it's a that is a great that's a great question. Uh, so it was it all started with a, a, a British pay toilet. I was in uh, Paddington Station in London and was getting a uh, was trying to go to the pay toilet or going to the toilet and uh, had a handful of change that I didn't know the denominations of because it was a foreign currency. So I'm sitting there staring at a handful of change and a, a rather frumpy uh, uh, business uh, English British businessman came up to me and asked me if I had change for uh, a pound. Um, so he could get his 35 pence to get through the gate and uh, I uh, and I'm like I don't know I held out my hand like help me and so he picked it out and gave himself his dollar his pound change and showed me that I had 35 pence to get in and then as we're going through the turnstile he says together we're better and I'm like yes we are and so I told this story as a um, as an anecdote to a, a, a friend of mine who's a um, who helped us get this co-op started um, and he said uh, together we're bitter and I'm like that sums it up perfectly it's exactly what we are um, it's the only thing bitter about us is our beer so um, which is a cheesy slogan but uh, um, it works